This is Formula SAE FastCast, the official podcast of the Formula SAE series. I'm Mike Sorg, uh, podcast and video producer here with the SAE CDS series, and we're really excited. Hey, it's a big year for Formula. It is the 40th anniversary of Formula SAE, and it's been really cool to see it uh, evolve and to talk about the great past. We have uh, two people here that are, have been a part of Formula since the very beginning. First of all, somebody who's no stranger, we've had him on a, a one or two of these shows before over the last few years, Bob Seckler. Uh, I just have in my notes CDS Big Boss because he's had so many <laughs> titles over the years. How are you doing, Bob? I'm doing good, Michael. How are you? Excellent. Excellent. And then we also have with us, I believe, a first timer on the show, Ron Matthews. He's with the University of Texas of Austin, and he's been uh, uh, there since uh, year one as well. How are you doing, Ron? Good. How are you, Michael? Excellent. So, of course, a lot of history, uh, oh, geez, just a lot of history on this call <laughs> to begin with here. Uh, but for both of you, can you pl- tell us a little bit about yourself and, and your kind of the, the professions and your professions and what you do now as it relates to formula? Well, I was with SAE for 35 years, if you can imagine that in this day and age. But uh, before that, uh, I was involved in the advertising business uh, and I took a job at SAE just to get away from the city and the commute and everything, and uh, didn't even know where Warrendale, PA was at that time. But never knew I'd end up there for 35 years, but uh, uh, doing the CDS programs, I started off in the exhibits development there. But now I've retired after 35 years, and retirement is really nice when you're not uh, quarantined in your house. (laughs) <laughs> that's that, that's made it my my getaway was uh going fishing or going to the store but now i i do a little bit of volunteer work for habitat for humanity which is very rewarding in itself uh i paint watercolors i fish quite a bit and i read which i stopped doing for a long time and as well as the various home improvements that come up around here but you stay quite busy when you're retired. Excellent. And what about you, Ron? Uh, I'm still on the faculty at uh, the University of Texas, still the SAE uh, faculty advisor, still the former SAE faculty advisor. Uh, Ron, can you tell us a little bit about uh, an idea of how Formula began and how your students kind of benefited from the program? And so I joined the faculty of the mechanical engineering department at the University of Texas at Austin, the flagship university, in January of 1980, so 41 years ago. Uh, and that first semester, I taught the uh, engines course, which hadn't been offered in quite a while, so there was a pent-up demand for it. And the uh, first week of class, I told the students that I was going to start a UT student branch of the Society of automotive engineers. So quite a few students were really enthused about that. And so they began searching for an SAE uh, student engineering design competition uh, that our new student branch could enter. And SAE had offered many Baja for quite a few years, uh, but there had been uh, a competition that involved asphalt racing in 1979, the previous year. Uh, called Mini Indy at the University of Houston. So they wanted to go asphalt racing, so they tried to get into Mini Indy in 1980, only to find out that uh, it it had been a one-year competition. Uh, So the students uh, thought about that and decided that uh, we should start our own competition. Uh, So Mini Indy uh, used single-cylinder Briggs & Stratton engines like Mini Baja, and that the students couldn't touch like many Baja. And so they said, well, let's use real engines and allow the students to uh, modify them any way they want. That's how the idea uh, developed. And so we had a a couple of students who, uh, Robert Edwards and John Tilkamp, who got together with the other SA students and uh, told them, "Let's, let's start our own competition. Um, and so the other students were also enthused, and so um, they approached me, and I, I was an untenured assistant professor, and so like an idiot, I said, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> and so this is back before the internet, back before email, 
So I called up uh, SA headquarters. They put me in touch with uh, Bob Seckler, whose title at the time was, I believe, uh, he, he was uh, the, the manager of educational relations for SAE, uh, and told him that we wanted to start uh, this new competition that I named Formula SAE. Uh, and Bob said yes. And so that's basically how it got started. Did did they have a standardized engine that first year, Ron? No. So that first year, we let them use any engine they wanted to, as long as the carburetor exit diameter was less than an inch. Okay. And okay. so uh, uh, Wankels were allowed. Uh, Wankel is a four-stroke engine, and yeah. SAE has since outlawed Wankel engines. I don't know why, but they are. No one entered. Engines. No one entered. That's why we can't. We just touched them out. <laughs> well, we we entered one year, yeah. but yeah, they were really fragile, uh, and yeah. so we gave up on it real rapidly. So I guess you could eliminate it because it was so fragile; it was a bigger pain in the neck than it was worth for the students to even try. So, going from that, uh, Bob, t- tell me about uh, receiving that. Uh, you know that proposal for formula under SAE and, and kind of that development from there on. You know, we were watching engineering enrollments were dropping, I think, at the time and we were looking for activities to sort of uh, pump up the uh, the engineering enrollments. And uh, when Ron called, I thought, you know, all sorts of things went through my head, you know, interdisciplinary teams and recruitment of engineers, you know, through our sponsors, uh, I just saw saw loads of opportunity, and it was a natural follow-on to Baja, but with a lot more choices. It was a lot more technical and brought a lot of different uh, disciplines uh, into it. But it was was a winner uh, for us. We were at the right place at the right time with that. Uh, It wasn't something that you could go into faculty and say, hey, we want your students to build a race car. Because they didn't get real excited about that. Uh, they were worried about job space, insurance, <laughs> everything you can imagine. Uh, so we decided to push this thing at the grassroots level through students. Uh, and that worked. Uh, that was a real exciting project or senior design project. Uh, and I imagine that it became a real strong uh, recruitment advertisement for the university engineering schools. Yes, indeed, it has. And so that was kind of a new opportunity for that. It was to was for the students to to kind of have something new to kind of uh, sink their teeth into at the time, right? Well, it was an opportunity, you know, to take the classroom learning and put it into a real life project. I mean, they actually had to develop a vehicle from the ground up, and you know, what better experience could the auto industry ask for than that? So most universities, in fact, maybe all. Uh, mechanical engineering schools and probably all the other departments as well have a course called uh, the senior design project where the students take the knowledge gained in their coursework and apply it to a real world problem but that has to be a problem they solve in one semester with a team of three or four students Uh, it might be an interdisciplinary team or it might not be in formula sae you have to design an entire car have to design, fabricate, test, and compete an entire car from scratch. And so it is much better as a uh, learning tool for the students than the uh, traditional senior design class. In fact, there are some universities, there are some universities that have made uh, development of their Formula SA car a one-year senior design course, and only students who are on the Formula SA team can be in that course. They have a separate course for students who want to do something other than Formula SA as their senior design. Yeah, this this type of design activity, too, was uh, looked upon kindly by the accreditation board, too, for engineering school. So that pushed the envelope a little bit for our growth when schools were going through accreditation and needed a design program or a team project, you know, those sorts of things, especially interdisciplinary teams. So schools were keen to start it up. How has that program kind of evolved since its inception in 1981? There there, there are now more than 650 teams from 50 countries that have to uh, design, fabricate, test, compete a new Formula SAE car every year. 
there are now Formula SE competitions in, and correct me if I get this wrong, uh, Japan, Australia, Brazil, Italy, Austria, Germany, England, and two in the United States each year. Uh, and the U.S. competitions are held after the foreign competitions, and they will send, the foreign competitions will send their very best teams to the U.S. Um, so the North American schools have to compete not just against the North American schools, but against the very best teams in the world. Yeah, I used to tease that it was uh, SAE's most recognized global brand, and they never liked that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I strongly suspect that's correct. I, that's why. Um, <laughs> but I think the globalization of the program was huge. Uh, and like I was saying before, the uh, – acceptance and integration into the ac academic side uh, of things. Um, team makeup uh, today is incredibly different. Uh, I mean, people are pretty much just running like a small business. You know, students would call up. In fact, we got the, the membership requirement for students changed because of students calling me and saying, look, we don't just work with engineers to build a car. I said, that makes perfect sense. So yeah. we, opened up, we opened up student membership to anyone who had an interest in cars, automobiles, the automotive industry. And I think that changed teams a lot where now they might bring in a psychology major to be team manager. We should we should try that. That's a good idea. <laughs> bring in someone from the business side, uh, marketing side to do sponsorships, which is a lot of work. Uh, finances. It usually, unfortunately, falls upon the faculty advisor, right, Ron? Yeah, unfortunately. So you really need a business student on the team. Uh, but our team this year also has um, students from the art school and from architectural engineering. And we always have, uh, always have students from aerospace engineering and mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. But getting architectural engineering and art and business um, makes it truly interdisciplinary. I say, and also the, the the evolution into electric seems to be a big step forward. That's a real big one. It was funny how I, I realized how little electrical engineers and mechanical engineers got along. <laughs> we, had, we, had, we had an actual <laughs> fist fight at a Formula SAE competition between an electrical and mechanical over changing the air intake restrictor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's... Uh, it has changed. You know, there's a lot of little black boxes now. And uh, I don't know about you, Ron, but I think the teams that keep it simpler are better off uh, when it comes to problem solving when they have issues. Absolutely. Uh, so I think that's that's changed dramatically. The electronics, uh, you know, the use of lightweight materials, composites, that's been a huge change. In fact, I think Ron built the first composite car. Yeah, we did. But that was tremendous for taking weight off of the vehicles. Uh, they've become much smaller. I mean, heck, I went back to the days when uh, we had huh, a wooden car. I don't know if you remember that, Ron. No, I don't remember that. It was a wooden formula <laughs> car. They didn't look like really? much like <laughs> Yeah, they didn't look much like race cars uh, then. Uh, we had a team uh, that didn't have a welder. And instead of going out and hiring one, because they were low budget those, those days, they riveted a frame together. Do you remember that one? Riveted? No, I didn't see that one either. And they wow. finished. And they finished. That's the bigger no one. No kidding. Yeah, and, yeah. I'm impressed. Uh, but you don't see anything like that. I think, I think the uh, infusion of the European schools uh, really up the bar on the technology side of things for better and for worse. Ron, you're still involved with uh, Formula, so it's been 40 years of Formula yeah, for you. 40 years for me, right? And now we have uh, we have a Formula SA Electric uh, team as well. So and mm -hmm. we have had for this this is our fourth year in that. Excellent. And, and Bob, you, for you, it's been well. I was involved for about, I was a SA for about five years before they talked me into doing this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I used to race race cars a bit and motorcycles, so it was a little bit intriguing uh, to me, but. Uh, when I went to my first event, which was a Baja event up in Montreal, I was just awestruck. I thought, boy, this is the golden ticket here uh, as far as student membership. 
Excellent. So, so the biggest thing, you know, there's multiple competitions with CDS. What, what's the biggest difference as a spectator for formula versus everything else? I think a lot of it depends on your interests. I think uh, formula, just the sheer power of the vehicle and the design and the technical features is very interesting. But you don't get much wheel-to-wheel racing as you do in uh, Baja. But on Baja, you don't go very fast. You feel like you're, you feel like you're going fast, but you don't really go that fast. Uh, so from a spectator side, I I don't know. I tend to think I tend to think Baja is more popular spectator wise. What about you, Ron? Yeah, I think that Formula SAE just brings entirely student uh, generated uh, asphalt race cars. There's a lot of enthusiasm that goes along just with the fact that. Uh, you've got these cars that have the power to weight ratio of a Formula One car uh, that students uh, designed and fabricated and uh, are competing against each other. They look like they're going a lot faster than they are. So the way the race car course is laid out, uh, they'll go maybe a max of 65 miles per hour, uh, but they look like they're going a whole lot faster than that. Uh, yeah, and the, the course is respect for the vehicle. The vehicles aren't really built to run on an oval, let's say. Right. But the, the, all the courses are spec built. Yeah, you know, I did want to say one of the big changes in the program is when it from when it went from building a race car to building a race car for an imaginary manufacturer uh, and a production run. That that was a big change. Uh, uh, when we started, uh, and I guess Baja did that first, the limited production run. But I think that changed things uh, as far as design and everything. So does that become more of an exercise in can we make this repeatable versus can we get this done for just one run? Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Uh, it does. You know, manufacturability, it, it becomes a big issue in your design. Cost becomes a big issue. So the students have to think about things from a whole new perspective or a whole uh, and a whole additional perspective uh, once um, they realize that this is supposed to be a, a, a car that uh, you want to manufacture a thousand of them a year uh, to sell to enthusiasts. Uh, and how are you going to develop a car that you can actually uh, sell? to the consuming public that'll do what you need it to do at the lowest cost you can possibly uh, make it for. Do you guys have any other additional thoughts on how the uh, industry and technology has changed over the last 40 years? Oh, 40 years is a long time, Mike. Yeah, so <laughs> back in 1980, there was no email, there was no internet. Uh, and so we had to uh, write back and forth uh, or call Bob on the phone uh, we had to get um, the list of all of the SAE student branches so that we could try to get <laughs> student teams to come to this first competition. And we had to mail everybody. We had to send them mail and hope they would mail us back. Uh, it ended up that six teams said they would come, only four did come, and that included us. So <laughs> we didn't really have to travel for it. Uh, but it wasn't a, a national competition, so it was uh, University of Texas, University of Tulsa from Oklahoma, University of Cincinnati from Ohio, and Stevens Institute of Technology from New Jersey. Now, ha having access to the internet and email has changed things a lot, uh, a lot easier for uh, the teams to uh, find and buy parts and, and go online and learn some things about designing. We actually had a poster made that we used to send out to student chapters. And it was either a picture of a Formula car or a Baja vehicle flying up in the air. Uh, and underneath, and it was fairly big and it was four color. Because we noticed in engineering schools, most of the uh, literature was pretty boring on the bulletin boards. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right, Ron? You noticed that too, huh? <laughs> so, so we put this four color poster of a race car on there with the slogan SAE wants you for more information and that's how students would advertise our meetings and talk about the project so it worked so also back in the uh, early days of Formula SAE so the first one was 1981 there was electronic fuel injection on cars uh, and onboard computers on cars 
but there was there were no fuel injectors that were small enough for the uh, smaller engines required for a Formula SAE vehicle. So everybody was running carburetors back then. Uh, there were no aftermarket reprogrammable computers. Uh, so even if you even if there were an injector, uh, you didn't have the uh, capability of taking over control. Uh, so now they can do that. Now they can get uh, electronically controlled fuel injectors. Uh, there are a variety of aftermarket computers where you can take over control of the engine. Uh, there's now, well, back then there was no software uh, that helped you design anything about a car. Uh, and now we have uh, lots of software packages that help you design the car, uh, that, allow, that help you design the intake system on the car. Uh, and you can take your virtual car out and race it virtually against, say, your last year's car to see whether this year's team is doing better than last year's team did. And none of that was available back then. The users are beginning to hand over control to the onboard navigation systems very rapidly. I mean, we'll, we'll be dealing with fully autonomous vehicles in a while. I can't say I look forward to that. but <laughs> Excellent. Do you guys have any uh, uh, memorable moments you guys would like to share? Oh, my. You want to sit down I mean, we got a couple of beers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll give you mine. Mine goes back to that very first uh, Formula SAE competition. So we had it in the parking lot of UT Baseball Stadium, Dishfalk Field. A number of uh, judges who volunteered for uh, that very first competition, and that included, let's see, Malcolm Abel, Larry Bendeley, Jim Brown, Fred Buckingham, Sam Idy, Clark Kibler, Jerry Wallingford. Uh, but a name that everybody uh, will probably recognize is that famous race car engineer, uh, driver, owner, builder, uh, Jim Hall, uh, flew in from the Indy 500 and was a judge at the very first competition. And we had this huge rainstorm come through. It's what's called a, a Memorial Day flood. Uh, and so it just drenched everybody and the track and nobody had rain tires. So we just kept running in the rain on asphalt and running on slicks. And so our Vice President was driving the car, Sylvia Obergon, now Sylvia Singh, and she had a car hydroplane, as you would expect, uh, and slid out of control and wrecked the front spoiler on our car, which was interesting because, like all the other teams, we had no money. And in fact, we had to come up with money to throw the event, plus the money to try to build the car. But somebody at UT, one of the research labs, uh, had a, a pile of sheet titanium that they said, well, yeah, we don't need that. You can have it. And so we built a front spoiler out of titanium. So this would have been a, a spoiler that was worth a whole lot more than our car. And it ended up being a big wrinkled mess after running into the curb. Mm. I think the big ones with me, I, never, I, I have a zillion of them. From some I probably can't even talk about on here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think the... I think, I think the uh, Real big one for me was we, we were, I think, I think I met uh, Paul Allen from Georgia Tech. Do you know Paul, Ron? No, I'm afraid I don't. He was a student at Georgia Tech. He went to General Motors. Um, but they, Georgia Tech was really into this. They were the first one to show up with a semi, you know, a painted semi GT Motorsports. I was really impressed. Oh, wow. But he called me from General Motors and he said, I've been thinking you got to bring this event up to Detroit to get the proper attention it needs from the industry. So he set up a meeting uh, for me and VP at uh, General Motors and who offered the use of Milford Proving Grounds. So we were able to move this thing into a major facility in the heart of automotive country uh, and put on an event there where we ran actually symmetrical endurance courses. Uh, which was kind of neat, but that was a big event. That was that made that event special, and I think it really made it uh, grow. And I think the second one was our first international event. We were invited by IMEC E in um, the Institute of Mechanical Engineers in the UK to do a demo event over there. So we took a couple teams over, and uh, Michael and Suzanne Royce. And we did a demo event uh, at a facility over there, uh, and that was pretty neat. It just took off. They had students in from all the universities uh, to take a look at it. And, of course, motorsport is 
pretty big stuff in uh, UK. It's kind of odd the UK team has never won Formula SAE. Wow, yeah. That was huge there, and that's where we began to grow internationally you know, with uh, Australia, uh, then Japan, and and beyond that. So I think that's all been pretty pretty memorable for me the first time, you know, <laughs> showing up in Australia at uh, uh, Yu Yang uh, Proving Grounds of Ford down in Geelong, uh, Australia. And uh, they say, well, we're going to have it out there. And I'm walking up to the site, uh, the track, and it says, please beware. Uh, eight of the world's most poisonous snakes live here. <laughs> And that's what we were going to do this doing the bed. Okay, I'll bring a couple hundred kids down here. Now that, that those are probably the two 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 biggest things. Forming that consortium was a huge boost for Formula SAE because once we got in Milford Proving Ground, I knew it would be easy to go ask Ford if they wanted to host it next. And I did the same with uh, Chrysler. After they'd all run it, they decided to have a consortium. Uh, operations so they weren't competing against each other but they all wanted to recruit engineers and they all have as as we're heading into 40 years here what where do you see the competition going from here (laughs) well kelly probably be the best one to ask that question (laughs) (laughs) Uh, virtual events autonomous you know auto drives uh be very popular I think, you know, a lot of people keep thinking formula is going to go away, but, you know, we have the formula electrics now. And I think there's some basic stuff in formula. It's, you know, when you look at this thing, uh, uh, project management probably makes up, would you say 75% of the learning involved there, Ron, is project management? Oh, yeah, that's huge. Yeah, it's uh, it's still an excellent project. Uh, and it's still very popular. Uh, it still works on the design side of things, but there's a big push for uh, autonomous operation, fuel economy, hybrids, and electrics. And I think that's where it will be headed, unless we're going to have hydrogen cars. I don't know. Yeah, I hope not. No, that, that, a little too dangerous. But I think, you know, you know that's, that's where it will be headed, to the autonomous side. Wouldn't you think, Ron? Uh, maybe eventually. Yeah, eventually. I th- think think that would start off as a separate competition. Oh yeah, yeah. I say al- al- already we are seeing Auto Drive with the Auto Drive Challenge. That's uh, in, in their third year now, and uh, it, it'll be interesting to see um, those cars going more than you know five miles an hour that they do now. <laughs> yeah, I mean the Germans have in- the Germans have incorporated uh, the autonomous vehicles right in with the competition. How do they do that? How do the Germans do it? Yeah, I don't know if they run a separate class or not. Uh, I'm, I think they may run a separate class. I'm not exactly sure on the details uh, about how they do that, but I know they've incorporated it right into their formula student German. Wow. So, and these are formula cars with automated technology integrated. Yes. Wow. That might be worth another podcast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Ron and Bob, for joining us here on the show. Do uh, you have any parting words for uh, people going into future competitions? I'd say that uh, it vastly improves your prospects as a new hire engineer. A lot of a lot of companies look for that. Even companies that are not automotive related are looking for experience uh, in Formula SAE or, or another one of the SAE CDS competitions. And that uh, by doing this, they will make friendships that will last them a lifetime, the other members of their team. Yeah, I, I think, you know, from my end, I, t- I tell students, you don't have to win to win. That's you just, sure. just doing the project, you win. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you're provided with a network of people that you'll know many of them for the rest of your lives, your, your network in the industry. And uh, I see that working all the time. The fact that we have so many people, uh, alumni of the competition, come back and help now is very gratifying. I think that, you know, just the network and the training you get uh, outside of uh, your classroom learning, communication skills, the budgeting, the project management, leadership skills. I don't know how many people I've seen as freshmen students cleaning wheels that grew into team leaders 
manage the whole project. And that says a lot on the resume. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for joining us here. And again, looking forward to 40 more years of Formula SAE. Uh, thank you, Bob and Ron, for joining us. Hey, invite me again in 40 years, Mike. <laughs> Will do. Will do. I'll set the calendar. All right. <laughs> thanks a lot, guys. And of course, everybody out there, if you if this is your first episode that you've listened to make sure you do subscribe to the podcast the uh fast cast on your favorite podcast platform or of course download the app so you don't miss any of the information about the formula se competition until next time everybody stay safe out there. thanks for listening to formula sae fast cats as always we want to hear from you so email us at formula sae at sae.org the show notes for this episode can be found at www.fsaeonline.com. Stay safe and we'll catch you next episode.